And now it's time for Power of Prophecy with your host, former professor at the University of Texas at Austin, career United States Air Force officer, and best-selling author, Tex Mars. Hello, friends. This is Tex Mars, and welcome to another edition of Power of Prophecy. Today, we've got an action-packed program. You don't want to miss this, folks. You don't want to miss it. So gather around uh, your your internet, your computer, your radio, whatever you've got there, your your CD tape, whatever you're listening to. We have a, a dynamic program today. My good friend, Edward Henry, is with me. Let me tell you a little bit about Edward Henry. If this is your first time to hear him, you're going to be very, very happy. Because Ed Henry is... It's, he's a great man. He's a lawyer. He's an attorney. He's a graduate of the University of Notre Dame and of Loyola University. Now, that makes him a bona fide Catholic, doesn't it? Well, no, it doesn't. <laughs> because Edward Henry read the Bible for himself. And he listened to the instruction given by the Holy Spirit. And he became a born-again Christian. That made all the difference in the world, and it will to you too if if you need the Lord Jesus. It will make all the difference. Okay, now, he's written a number of books, and you know about you know Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great, a Bloody Zion, absolutely a fantastic book. And, and these are books that you won't find in bookstores because Ed Hendry does not write for the bookstores. I mean, I'm sure he'd like to get a bestseller. He wants people to read his books. But he writes for God. Now, when you work for God, <laughs> you don't make a lot of money. But I'll tell you, your blessings will really come in. I feel the same way about my books, uh, too. I'm very blessed by them. Now, I'm blessed by reading Edward Henry's books, and especially this book. Now, he, you know, I, I got this package in, like I get so many packages. I opened it, and this very thick book fell out. And I said, oh, boy, I hope that's not a good book. Or I'm going to have to read it. You know, <laughs> there are many of them I don't read because, you know, the subject matter or whatever, or it just looks like it's not a good book. But this book, immediately I saw it was by Edward Henry, and I realized I was going to have to read it. And actually, I enjoyed it because it's an interesting book. It talks about the Antichrist, the beast revealed. Think about that. The Antichrist is the beast and Edward Henry, an attorney, has revealed who he is, really what he's going to be doing, and how he's connected with the Roman Catholic institution. It's an, it's an amazing book. And by the way, it's around 700 pages. So, you know, it's not going to be a pocketbook. You can't put it in your back pocket. But I think you will want to get around the fireplace or maybe your air conditioner in that right now. <laughs> And read this book. And I have Edward Henry with me today. That's why I want you to continue to listen. Edward, welcome to Power of Prophecy. Thank you, Tex. It's good to be here. You've been uh, several times with me here with your other books. And each one is a blessing because it's so, you, you know, you, you have so many, so much documentation. You know, I go to Christian bookstores and there's all kind of little bitty books. And they're usually about 150 pages and that gives the guy's opinion on something, but you don't just give opinion, you give facts, you give documentation, don't you? Yeah, I try not to just put forth an argument, but rather put forth proof. And what a person says only has validity based on the authority of what he brings. Mm. And so in this book, I try to cite the authority for what I say. When someone reads the book, they can check and see where I got my information. I have over a thousand endnotes in the book. So it's not just my opinion. It's not just an argument. I've set forth evidence proving the, who the Antichrist is and the methods of the Antichrist. There are, there's been a lot of information that has been put out about the Antichrist, who people think he is. And it's a lot of misinformation, some of which is put out by agents of Rome uh, who have infiltrated the seminaries and churches, and they 
put forth all sorts of theories about some future political leader. Perhaps Islam is the Antichrist, or Prince Charles even, or George Bush, or Barack Obama. A lot of that information, a lot of that misinformation is very commonly believed, it seems. And so it's really necessary to have a book that sets forth the evidence that, in fact, the Antichrist sits in the Vatican at Rome. It's necessary to set forth the evidence that proves that case so that someone who reads the book will be well-grounded in that information. Now, why is that important? Because God commands us to be not only harmless as doves, but wise as serpents. In Matthew 10:16, he said, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. It is important that Christians be armed with the methods of the Antichrist and that they know who he is. God says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, so it's important that they be informed of who the Antichrist is. And it's something that once they know, they should let others know as well, okay? Jesus, the ultimate in Watchmen, he thought this was very important for people to know. He stated in Matthew chapter 24, there shall rise many There was a rise false Christ. He said so. And he said, Behold, I have told you before. So he's saying, Listen, I'm warning you ahead of time. There are going to be false Christ. And so this is something that is important to Christ, and it should be important to us. We should understand who is the Antichrist, what are his methods. Hmm. Well, well, now, he said in Matthew 24, verse 5, Jesus, that is, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. So he is going to be very close to, you know, what the world thinks that Christ should be. He's not going to be a Buddhist or a Muslim. He can't be, because he he would not appear to be Jesus Christ. Nobody would believe him. Nobody would believe a Muslim who said, I'm Jesus, or I'm just like Jesus. So... They've got it all wrong, and of course, it's sort of it's popular now. I'm sure everybody, you know, uh, rapidly goes and buys the next book that has <laughs> the, the the Muslim Antichrist. But it doesn't just it just doesn't match up with Scripture, and Scripture is our guide, isn't it? Yes, you're, and you're, you've hit the nail right on the head. Antichrist does not necessarily mean against Christ only. Antichrist is a a word that is very pregnant with meaning. It means not only against Christ, but as a substitute for Christ. Mm. So anti means in place of and at the same time against. So we have to look not just at those people or organizations that are against Christ, but those people or organizations that seek to or claim to be in place of Christ. I was going to ask you about this Pope, Pope Francis. Uh, he's, he's the most, well, he's wildly popular among the, oh, I'd, I'd say the, the non-Christian set, particularly, you know, the, the news media love this guy. Now, he, he recently gave a statement about global warming. He's a big, big believer in global warming, and uh, he, he's put out an entire encyclical, you know, telling people global warming is true. The earth's getting, you know, hotter and hotter, and we've got to do something about it. And what we must do is have global governance. Now, isn't that, how does that, how does that strike you? In other words, he wants a global government, a a, a new world order with a man at the top, I suppose, uh, him perhaps. But, but he says, you know, it's because of global warming. So he's found a a rationale, hasn't he? He's, He's found something that people can worry about and, you know, and, and run around saying, oh, we're going to lose everything. The world is going to be over if we don't do something right now. And he, he wants to be the leader of the whole world in this thing. Well, that's the ultimate objective, of course. And he wants to use government power in order to effectuate that, to bring, him, to, to, to bring himself into power. Right now, his 
dominion seems rather small. People say the Vatican, well, that's, you know, that's not much territory. But remember, in Daniel, the prophecy that prophesies the Antichrist calls the Antichrist the little horn as a description of the territory. But the influence he has is worldwide. And his influence runs into governments. And he controls governments through his influence. And yes, global warming is one of the prongs of the strategy to enslave the world. Now, um, evidently, you know, the Catholic Church is just, just, I mean, riddled with the homosexuality and pedophilia throughout, and it, it never seems to get any better. And th they're rampant with Satanism, and you prove that in your book. We want to talk about that a little bit later on, the Satanic ritual aspect in the Catholic Church. But he's not talking about those things. He goes over to global warming. And he, so he tries to separate the things that the church is doing from the things he's claiming that need to be you know, cleaned up, isn't he? Well, of course he's not going to point out the pederasty that is rampant within the Roman Catholic Church. He's going to steer away from that at all costs. So he'll try to focus on everything but that. Hmm. Benedict made some really foolish statements to try to excuse the behavior of the Catholic priests in their pederastic behavior. He stated that they they were part of the culture of the of the 70s, where people did not think it was wrong to molest children. Now that's just ridiculous. It, it's so absurd for him to make that kind of comment. First of all, he was trying to suggest that this is all something way in the past, back in the 70s. And second, he tries to suggest that society somehow had accepted pederasty as normal behavior. Boy, that's, that's just... A... And it's so, wow. it's so perverse for him to even say that. It was even less accepted than it is now, and it is not accepted. It has never been accepted that pederasty is normal behavior. Basically, what he was trying to say is uh, the Catholic priest didn't realize it was wrong to rape children. <laughs> and, but this is the Man. type of thinking that they have. They actually do not think it's wrong. And the, the movement, this uh, gay and lesbian movement, they're pushing gay and lesbian rights, is just the first step towards legalizing pederasty. That's their ultimate goal. People don't realize that these, the LBGT community is made up of organizations that put forth as part of their, their political plank the, the promotion of pederasty, the uh, removal of all laws that call into that that that, uh, that li limit the age of consent. They, the 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 homosexual community ultimately wants to be able to have sex with children. That is what their uh, organizations lobby for. That is what they. That is their ultimate aim. And so this idea of giving them special privileges and special rights, and that's what they're working for now, is just the first step towards ultimately gaining that privilege of having sex with children without any legal ramifications. Well, now, this Pope, now, let me just take his side, which I don't like to do very much, Edward, but let's just take his side. He said when I asked about homosexuality, he said, who am I to judge? That's right. That's right. <laughs> now, what, what he, do you he's, sort of, he's sort of laying the groundwork. And, and what this comes down to, it, it, people have to understand that this is, this is sort of right now, right now, we are at the fulcrum of a contest between civil rights and constitutional rights. Mm. It may sound odd, but the idea of civil rights, which really means government-based privileges, it, there are uh, many times in contravention to the God-given rights, which we recognize as constitutional rights. And so these 
civil rights that are now being grasped and being sought and actually being obtained by the sodomite community are being used to undermine the God-given rights which are protected by the Constitution. I'll give you an example. And so, th and this sort of illustrates it. There was a bakery in Oregon, and there was a lesbian couple that wanted to have that bakery bake a cake for their lesbian wedding. The, um, they thought about it, and they went back to the lesbian couple and said, this violates our conscience. We, we really can't take part in your lesbian wedding. We don't agree with that. Well, the lesbian couple went to the state, and the state found that that conduct of refusing to bake that cake violated the laws of Oregon regarding discrimination against LB, LGBT communities. LGBT is an acronym they use to describe lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. It's basically the sodomite communities. And because they were discriminating against this lesbian couple, they fined them, they fined the bakery $135,000. Now, this is still in litigation, but what, they had the effect of closing down the bakery. They're now out of business. The husband is working as a uh, trash collector. But the, this community, the LBGT community, was working very closely with the Department of Labor in Oregon to orchestrate this persecution is what I call it, they call it a prosecution, of the, of the bakery. Now, here you have a contest between the civil rights, that is, the government-based privileges, based on a law, against the constitutional rights of the bakery uh, to practice their religion as they see fit. Now, in Oregon, there is a constitutional provision that prohibits the government from having any law that will control the free exercise or enjoyment of religious opinions or interfere with their rights of conscience. That is a, re that is a constitutional provision in Oregon that protects a person's individual right to freedom of religion, which is a God-given right. Not, it's not bestowed by the government. The privilege that they're protecting is bestowed by the government. It's a law that prevents discrimination. And there's going to be this contest. This is just one example. Uh, another one was the Indiana law, which sought to put into law a protection of citizens who wanted to exercise their religious rights, okay, so that something like that uh, would not happen in Indiana. In Indiana, that's been the, a real controversy in Indiana. But the, the bottom line is the... This contest between constitutional, individual, God-given rights and these civil rights, okay, which are actually privileges bestowed by the government, is going to continue. And as long as the government is bestowing these special privileges on groups, and that's what it is, these are group privileges, the individual rights of the citizens uh, will be taking a second, uh, a back seat. What they have to do is when they litigate these things, they must... Uh, they must assert their constitutional rights at the outset. Uh, John Kennedy, on his, in his inaugural address, uh, he stated that the uh, that the um, the beliefs that the rights of man come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God, is a the revolutionary belief for which our forefathers fought and are still at issue around the world. And that is the key thing that must be understood, that, that our rights do not flow from the state. That's All right. of, whenever you hear of a march on Washington, they're trying to get the force of government to be used for their particular benefit. Rather than relying on individual God-given rights, they want a special privilege bestowed, bestowed upon them by the government. And... This, the, uh, this contest between religious freedom and uh, the sodomite special privileges is a contest that is going to be going on, and it's going to be continued to be fought. And I'm telling you, if they win, it's going to be the first step towards the persecution of Christians, where Christianity will become a outlawed because it will be viewed as 
trampling the rights of sodomites, because the religious beliefs are that sodomy is a sin, and they should not be able to engage in that, that pederasty is a sin, it's an abomination. It, and so these types of things, uh, which we would object to, uh, will cause for persecution against Christians. I see this as the fulcrum upon which the persecution of the Christian Church in the United States will begin. Well, you know, it seems to me, now, you know, it's not just something that we object to, uh, or, or that we would, uh, you know, tell a person it's a sin or whatever. It's 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 not that exactly. It seems to me that it goes deeper than that. They they have got into my heart and my mind, and they're saying if you believe Tex Mars from reading the Bible that sodomy is a sin, then you are a hater. Now there's there's the ultimate. If if you believe Edward Henry that sodomy is a sin and you get this from the Bible, then you are a hater, and your Bible, if it says that plainly, it is a book of hate, and it's God who you say wrote it. He must be a hater too. So you're a hater. The Bible is a hater. God is a hater. And all of you must be thrown out of, of, of proper good society. Yeah, that's very perceptive. Uh, the hate crimes laws, now require a predicate crime, and hate is simply a an element of that crime. But as you know, legislation can be amended very easily and changed to make hate itself the crime. Oh, that's, See, that's right exactly, now, that's exactly right. Somebody because of their race or ethnicity or whatever whatever category and that's considered a hate crime. Well even but even if they even if it's not a crime to say to uh -huh. think a certain thing or to say it for a certain thing right. is considered a hate crime. To say that sodomy is wrong. See oh, oh yes. that becomes the hate the hate crime. That would become the crime. Uh in other words, if you'll get back in your cave or your dungeon and where we cannot hear you, we'll close the door on you. Uh, you won't be fit for society. We're gonna we're gonna cordon you off. Uh, we're gonna you know ostracize you. Then you can do that. But they won't even do that. They will come after us even then and say we heard you. We heard you from way way you know a thousand yards away. We heard you mm -hmm. whispering back in there saying that sodomy is a sin. You're a hater. You will now be punished for that. So this is what I think you're absolutely right. And uh, people, you know, they say, well, what does it matter if a, if a bakery doesn't want to, you know, uh, bake a cake for a gate? Well, why would they do that? Why don't they go ahead and bake the cake? But, you know, there, there are other things involved. Now, let's go to, to your book. Now, you say there's satanic ritual abuse by Catholic priests. Now, that's been proven in the press. But maybe you can give some examples of that, how that relates to our subject, the Antichrist. The, the satanic yeah, you know, there are a number of examples that I set forth in the book of specific cases where it's been proven in court that the, molesta the, the uh, molestation of, of the children uh, and other people is a result of satanic ritual abuse by the Catholic priests. And, mm. and, the, and, and, and that has been concealed. That aspect of the pederasty by the Catholic priest has been concealed from the public. They don't, it is something that the Catholic Church cannot allow to be known. Because if it is known, then they'll understand why it is so pervasive and can never be stopped. All of these steps that were announced just this past uh, uh, week uh, with regard to steps that are being taken by the Pope to uh, address the issues of pederasty within the Catholic uh, uh, priesthood, those, that's all window dressing. They, they will never be addressed because this pederasty is so pervasive because it is based upon devil possession. These priests are driven to it by, by the devil and his, uh, and his demons. Okay? If you, if you read, uh, the, uh, uh, the book of Romans, okay, the, it says in Romans chapter 1 that they changed the glory of the incorruptible God unto the, uh, unto the image made like corruptible man, okay? 
all idols are demonic. We read about that in 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter 10. And when they engage in this conduct, this idol worship, God gave them up, it says, to uncleanness, through the lusts of their own hearts, to the son of their own bodies between themselves. Mm. Okay? And it's for this cause that men were, that would lay with men working that which is unseemly. And we read that in the, in the book of Romans. In the book of Romans, it explains why they're doing this. They're doing this because of the idolatry of the religion they're engaged in. That idolatry, t- uh, uh, causes a situation where the demons that are behind those idols, the devils that are behind those idols, now possess these people, okay, and they're driven to it, the priests who engage in these rituals. And that's why it states in the Bible, keep yourself from idols, abstain from the pollution of idols. Time and time again, uh, we're told to stay away from idols. Uh, However, the Roman Catholic Church actually removes that command from their Ten Commandments. They have a Ten Commandments which has actually removed the prohibition that's found in Genesis uh, chapter 20. In Genesis, I'm sorry, in Exodus chapter 20. In Exodus chapter 20, there is a prohibition uh, that states, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or in the earth beneath, where there's the water under the earth, thou shalt not bow thyself to them nor serve them. Now that's pretty clear. But here's what the Roman Catholic Church has done, because they are a church of idolatry. They have a Ten Commandments that says, their first commandment, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not have strange gods before me. So you can have gods as long as they're not strange. And the Catholic Church has determined that praying to Mary, that's not a strange God. Praying to Peter, that's not a, he's not a strange God, etc., etc. They have a whole pantheon of saints that they pray to that they don't consider are strange gods. And their second commandment, okay, it says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Now, notice what's missing. What's missing is the prohibition against making graven images and bowing down to them. That is missing from the Ten Commandments of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, that gives them nine commandments. To make up for that missing commandment, they have broken the last commandment against coveting into two commandments. Thou shalt not uh, covet thy neighbor's wife, and thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. They've broken that into two. That gives them now ten commandments. And what is one of the prophecies regarding the Antichrist? He will seek to change the times and the laws. This is a, the law of God, which he has now changed, the, ten, the very Ten Commandments of God, which is fulfillment of sure. the prophecy of the Antichrist. Well, you, you know, this is, this is astonishing, but I, I never recognized in Romans um, chapter 1 there how idolatry, it's idolatry that, that makes these people sodomites, that brings demons into their lives and, and, and makes their heart black. With these pedophile practices, I I never right. I never realized that, but I, now I can understand it. Why, why you know Anton Lavey of the Church of Satan and these Catholic priests, all of them feel compelled, you know, being idolaters, they they feel compelled to, to, well, really to sacrifice little children, innocent little children to to hell. That's this is this is astonishing. Revelation to yes. me, and I, I appreciate God bringing it through your book. Well, we're going to take a little break here, Ed. And when we come back, I'd like to talk to you about the dark secret of the Catholic liturgy. I, even the Mass, there's there's a secret to that. And uh, you know, the, the I mean, the, the the most hardened Catholic they've written me and say, now don't don't let anybody talk about the Eucharist. Don't let them talk about the communion. But there's a dark secret to it, and I'd like for you to tell people what that is, okay? All right. All right, folks, I'm with Edward Henry. We're talking about his excellent book, Antichrist, The Beast Revealed. I'm Tex Mars. You're listening to Power of Prophecy. Hello, friends. Tex Mars again. This book, Antichrist, The Beast Revealed. By Edward Henry. It's almost 700 pages. I'd be a little bit over that. I'm not quite sure here because 
you know, I, I get to reading this and I forget how many pages it is. But I want to tell you, this book has all kind of information about the Antichrist. And, you know, I get so many letters here about the Antichrist. It looks like we're on the cusp of the end of the age, people say. And people say, Tex, who do you think the Antichrist is going to be? Well, from now on, I'm going to tell them to get to Edward Henry's book and read that, and then let then they can let me know uh, who the Antichrist is. This is a, a great book, and 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 I, and I believe a lot in this book. Now, I believe the Antichrist is going to be Jewish, but he could be the Pope. He could be a Jewish Pope, and that's where Edward Henry and I sort of go right along there, go together. But in any case, he has all the evidence for the the, the Pope of Rome being the Antichrist. Now, this is not something, I mean, I, I, I credit Martin Luther and the great reformers. Uh, they also believe that. And people say, oh, that's old-fashioned. You know, the Catholic Church has changed. Oh, oh, has it ever changed? But it's gone right back to Babylon. And that's what Edward Henry shows here. And it, it, it's at the forefront of modern-day evil. And this evil world is headed is spiraling right into Babylon. I mean, folks, the further you go, the more you you lag back and you pick up the old evil because the horrible demon spirits, they learn things in Babylon. They practiced there and they're going to bring the same things up again and again. And, and that's the whole thing here. You need to understand about that to know why this uh, pederasty, why these priests are doing these horrible things, and why they've been protected for so long, why the Catholic Church has spent hundreds of millions, perhaps billions of dollars, bailing these people out and moving them from parish to parish, all of these things. But there's even more here. You know, people say, well, at least they have the Catholic Mass. At least they recognize that Jesus died on the cross. But guess what? Edward Henry... Uh, quotes priests, priests who are practicing today, who say this comes right out of Judaism. And it's it's a sexual phallic cult. I, I'm, I mean, you need to understand that. It is a sexual phallic cult. I know that because I've studied Judaism. I know about the tree of life. I know about all of their sexual idols and, and, and false gods that the Jews worship. And to think that they've now put them into the Catholic Church. And that's why the Pope says Jews do not need Jesus. That's right. The Catholic Catechism says Jews don't need Jesus. They've got, they've got their own covenant. They've got their own gods. Of course, this is a lie. It's a horrible lie. Every single human soul needs Jesus. But that's why the Antichrist is the Pope. Hey, he's a most recognized world leader, and he's in the temple of God, isn't he? Well, at least he's falsely there. He's a counterfeit. But please, I want you to understand, this book even talks about the Daniel, chapter uh, the, the, the 70 weeks of Daniel, and you'll read the true meaning of that. It's an amazing thing here, this book. I want you to have this book. And for $35, we'll send it right out to you. Now, I believe Edward's going to get as many copies printed as we need here. So please, buy this book. You might want to buy a copy for a pastor friend. You know, I mean, if he's too comfortable and sitting back in his old chair, you may want to come into his office and give him a copy of this. He'll probably fall over backwards. But he'll get up, and then he'll read it, maybe, uh, at least encourage him to. And he'll learn something rather than the old, same old dispensationalist books that has been reading for, you know, 30, 40 years and getting all confused about the Word of God. He'll find it straightened out for him. So I want you to have this book. Now, how do you get it? Send $35 plus $5 shipping and handling, a total of $40, to Power of Prophecy, 1708 Patterson Road, Austin, Texas, 78733. Hey, you can go to our website, powerofprophecy.com or texmars.com. And you're going to see an ad for this book. Jerry, I believe it's right on our homepage, isn't it? Yeah, there you go. Just click right on the homepage and order it. Use your charge card or your PayPal and uh, get the book, Antichrist, the Beast Revealed. 
during the week, Monday through Friday, during the workday, just call us. Call us toll-free. We'll pay for the call. 1-800-234-9673. Now, when you get this book, we're going to put you on our newsletter list. You're going to get Power of Prophecy newsletter every month. It's going to be a, an exciting topic. I know it's exciting. God gets me all excited every month when I get ready to write the newsletter. And it's, it's just an exciting uh, thing to write the newsletter. I might even be writing one about the Antichrist, about this book. Who knows? But I'll give you a free subscription to that when you get this book. All right. Absolutely free. Now let's return to our regular program. I have Edward Henry today as, as, as my guest. He's been my guest a number of times. We have many copies of his book, Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great. Maybe you've been wondering, who is Babylon the Great? There is a mystery there, and there's a mystery of iniquity. Oh, my goodness. Isn't the Bible exciting? It has so many mysteries. And and God rewards you. He's the spirit of prophecy. Jesus is, says in Revelation. He rewards you. He gives you a special blessing. You know, Edward, welcome back to Power of Prophecy. What what about that? Have you, you thank you? Have you gotten a special blessing? Because that's what Jesus says He'll give people for reading His Book of Prophecy. Oh, absolutely! And the uh, the wisdom from the Book of Revelations is really unapproachable, and it's amazing uh, the uh, what it will open up. Yeah, I I can't. I, I agree. Now, let's look at the dark secret of the Catholic liturgy. Now, the Catholics, you know, I, I was in the chaplaincy in the Air Force for 10 years uh, on the administrative side, and they had mass every day. A priest would come in, and they'd have a mass every day. And it would be the same thing. It was uh, in Latin back in those days, and they changed it to English. But it was the same wording, basically. But but every day. Now, you're saying there's something darkly secret about that that you've been able to discover. Yes. And, yeah, the topic we're going to get into now is um, it's kind of a mature topic, so just a warning to the listeners. Now, it is, there is a disturbing aspect to Roman Catholicism that people will find difficult to believe, which is in part uh, why I put end notes for everything I have in here. There's authority for everything I say, and so I'm not just making this up. This is authoritative. First of all, let me tell you that Roman Catholicism is a phallic religion. And what I mean by that is ultimately they engage in and are involved in the worship of the procreative act. Phallic symbolism is found throughout their liturgy. It is a liturgical religion. They call it a liturgical liturgical religion. But uh, it is, uh, that is a, a cover for the fact that it is a phallic religion, as is Judaism, as is Freemasonry. There is a commonality between these religions. The nucleus of Orthodox Judaism is the spiritual and sexual union of the female goddess, which they call Shekinah, with her male uh, consort, uh, which is called the uh, the uh, Tiferet. Now, the Catholic Mass is actually an enactment of this ma- this union of the Shekinah with God in the Eucharist. The Shekinah is the is present in the Eucharist during the Mass, and when the Catholic Mass is said. The Shekinah, who's considered to be the bride, is united with Tiferet uh, through the phallus of Tiferet, which is known as Yesod or Jesod. And that is, I'm sorry, uh, the, uh, that's the phallus of Einsof. The, uh, the god of Judaism is Einsof, and Yesod is the phallus of Einsof. They call the, the, uh, the phallus, it is one of the Tiferets, uh, one of the nine Tiferets of Einsoft. Now, I know this is very complicated. The language they use is bizarre. But, but it wait, is but wait, very wait, hold difficult on, hold, to weed hold on through just, all of these meanings. But hold on just a but minute, Andrew. Of, yes. let, let, me, let me say something here, Edward. 
what you're saying is it it is amazing and and mind boggling because most people don't know what Judaism really is. But I have the book by Israel Shahak, professor at at Hebrew University, who, who spells out exactly what the Juda, Judaism really is. And there are all these gods you're talking about, the Tiferet, the Hasad, which is a phallic god. And and there are all these gods and goddesses that the Jewish rabbis and the laymen worship. And you're saying that they find the, the same pro-action going on in the Catholic Mass. And it's, it's sort of mind-boggling because people don't, they think that the Old Testament is still loved by the Jews. And that the Jews just believe in, you know, God. That's all. But actually, yeah. they have a number of deities and gods, and you're talking about these. <laughs> that's what you're talking about. These strange Judaic gods that the average Christian has never heard about are the same ones you're finding in the Catholic Mass, right? That's right. Boy. In witchcraft, witchcraft, there are always two explanations that are provided for a ritual. There is one that is the exoteric, the public explanation, mm. the false explanation, if you will, that is provided to the public. And then there is the esoteric, the secret explanation, which is the true explanation for the ritual that is hidden, concealed. And what I'm telling you now is the esoteric explanation for what takes place in the Mass. And that Mass is actually flows from Judaism. Roman Catholicism is based upon Judaism. It is not the Judaism of the Bible. It is the Judaism of Babylon. So when we talk about Judaism, I'm talking about the religion of Babylon. This is a phallic religion which flowed from Babylon through the Jews into the Roman Catholic Church. The so Roman Catholic Church is basically Judaism for Gentiles. Wow, and, and yet... The rabbis that I've talked with and I've read about uh, all say this is modern day Judaism. This is what we teach. This is what we do. It, it's an incredible thing. And so Christians cannot get this just from reading the Old Testament, can they? Well, no. The the the, the Jews do not follow the Old Testament, and and God abraded them for that. Mm. Uh, I, I you know when Jesus was talking to the scribes and the Pharisees, he upbraided them for replacing God's laws with their tradition. Yes, he did. And in fact, even today, the, the very, the, the, the motions made by the Jews when they pray, it's called shuckling, and you probably notice with them swaying back and forth, okay? Well, when they do that, they're actually emulating copulation in sexual union with Shekinah. Well, that's just... That, those are actually <laughs> a hip thrust, and I, I apologize for getting into this. Well, no, you, you, uh, you gave readers, us a warning. It, it is, in fact, what is happening, and this is not something that is disputable. Now, that's called chuck uh, and I, chuckling. And I cite the authority in my book for these statements. Yeah, you, you call it shuckling, or they, they call it shuckling or devening. Yes. And, and so when they're, like, in front of the uh, Wailing Wall, let's say, in Jerusalem... And these little yes. rab these rabbis or these men in these dark clothes, the, the Jews, and there they are, and they go, mm, and they're they're moaning or whatever, chanting, and they're moving their bodies. Boy, that's copulation with the Shekinah, the the female. That's what they're simulating. Yes, that's 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 so sickening, and yet it's what we're seeing with our own eyes, and what they know is to is true. But they, they, they hope or they believe that Gentiles don't even are too stupid to know it. Yeah, these are uh, they don't they won't tell Gentiles. It's well known within the Jewish community, okay. But this is something kept secret from the Gentiles. Of course, they wouldn't want us to know that. Wow, that's just and so now back at back to the Catholic Mass. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. I'm just sort of amazed at this. You know, just it boggles my mind. But back to the Catholic Mass now and. So they have the Shekinah within the within the communion, the Eucharist. They say the Shekinah is in there, the the, the, yes. the female. So is that but, what's what's yeah. going on? Some kind of a sex act? That's right. Wow. That's right. It's a sexual union between Einsoff 
and the Eucharist, which is Shekinah, through Yesod, or Jesod, which is one of the Tephrats, uh, part of the triads of Einsof. Boy, you know. I, I, I know it sounds bizarre, okay, and it is bizarre, it is strange, but this is what you're dealing with when you're dealing with these heathen religions. Well, you, you know, you actually quote, you quote, this, uh, is, this is something that is kept secret. You, sh- you okay? quote this a priest? Kept secret from people in the Catholic Church. People in the Catholic Church do not understand this. This is not, if you ask a Catholic, they would deny it. They would deny it because they truly do not know this. Mm. This is kept secret. This is a secret doctrine. Yeah, that's okay, hilarious. this is not something that is publicly known. But you, uh, you, went out it, and you it, actually it have takes a you, lot of research uh, to get to this to this point. This is uh, uh, this is really deep, dark witchcraft. Boy, but you, you actually quote a, a well-known Catholic priest, and he's written all about this. He explains how how it works and the the, the Judaic meaning, and he he puts sort of Judaism and Catholicism together, doesn't he? This priest. Yes, and in fact, uh, the. Um, the, the the Eucharist itself has three initials on it, I H S, mm-hmm. and those three initials, the Catholic Church will say are the first three initials of Jesus' name. Okay, the problem is that if that were the case, it would be I E S, not I H S, oh. because if you Latinize Jesus' name, it would be J uh, I E S. And what they actually have, when you look through their explanation, and I document this in the book, you actually have with IHS, if you follow their explanation, you have a Latinized I, there is then a Greek H, okay, and then a Latin S. So you have a mixture of, if you believe their explanation, a Latin I, a Greek H, and a Latin S. Well... That makes no sense whatsoever, first no. of all. Second of all, it makes no sense to have the first three letters of a person's name. That's, that's not typically done, even, even in ancient times. I mean, John would not be J-O-H. Peter would not be P-E-T. It just wasn't done, okay? You'd have your first name, middle name, last name, that, that type of thing. The real explanation, see, the, that, the, what I've just given you is the exoteric, the public explanation. Uh, which does not make sense. The real explanation is that it's it's a uh, symbolism representing Isis, Horus, and Seth, three heathen gods and goddesses. Mm, that they were worshipped by the ancient is- Israelites. Yes. Who, who apostatized against God? Wow. Yeah. Well. Uh, yeah, and it gets even it gets even deeper than that. Okay. And again, I document this in the book. This is not disputable. There's actually, at times, the public worship of Lucifer during certain high masses. Yeah, let's talk about that. Um, the, you say the Pope. Now, somebody sent me a video. You know, I go along, and I, I get so many emails, and this guy sent me an email, a friend of the ministry, and said, Tex, you want to see the Pope having the Luciferian mass? Here it is. And I thought, oh, there's some trick to this. But it wasn't. It was a Catholic mass in which they were chanting to Lucifer. And the Pope, mm-hmm. Pope was, you know, praising Lucifer. And I was I was literally shocked. But evidently, this yep. ha- at certain times during the year, they have a Luciferian Mass. That's right. And and the actual, it's preached in Latin, okay, but the translation is as follows. Okay, flaming Lucifer finds mankind, I say, O Lucifer, who will never be defeated, Christ is your son who came back from hell, shed his peaceful light, and is alive and reigns in the world without end. So here they're they're saying that Christ is the son of Lucifer. How blasphemous is that? Now, the what explanation could the Catholic Church have for that? Well, here's their explanation. Again, this is their public explanation. That Lucifer metaphorically is a reference to Jesus Christ. Oh. That's and I, and I. This is right in there. You can look on the internet. People can can look up Lucifer in uh, the Catholic Encyclopedia, and this is what they say. And I'm quoting metaphorically the word applied to the King of Babylon, etc., etc. Okay, 
and finally to Jesus Christ himself. How, well, hold on just a minute. Well, let's stop right there. Metaphorically applied to the king of Babylon, and, 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 and then finally to Jesus himself. How do those two get together? I, very good point. <laughs> Wow. That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. I just thought I'd just catch well, they, they actually, you know, to, to attribute, by the way, the characteristics of the devil to God mm. is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And Jesus stated that all sin will be forgiven man except blaspheming the Holy Spirit. That is, attributing the characteristics of, of Satan to God. And, and that's what they've done here. And they've done that in their Bibles. Their Bible, if you look at um, their version, uh, the NIV, for instance, in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, they have, instead of Lucifer, which the King James has, uh, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Okay, that's a reference to the fall of Lucifer, and, it, and, and that's a prophecy of his destruction in Isaiah 14, 12. In the New International Version, okay, which the Catholic Church also has a New International Version, there's also a Protestant version of the New International Version, uh, how you have fallen from heaven, O morning star. Hmm. They replace Lucifer with morning star. Now, the interesting thing is, morning star is a title for Jesus Christ. In Revelation 22, 16, Jesus says, I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So here they're talking about, in the prophecy of Isaiah 14, 12, the destruction of Lucifer, and they've replaced Lucifer with Jesus Christ, and is now a prophecy of the destruction of Jesus Christ. Again, attributing the characteristics of the devil to Jesus, blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Well, you know, Freemasonry, you mentioned the connection there, the commonality between Freemasonry and, and Judaism and the Catholic Church in practice. Freemasons also, they literally worship at the highest levels, they they worship Lucifer, and uh, you know I had a, a high level Mason who wrote me a letter and said, "Text, you don't understand. Lucifer to the Mason is not the devil. He's a good God. We all we Masons believe in Lucifer. This is what the the Masons believe in. So the same thing holds for the Roman Catholic Church. Yes. Wow. You know, if people, if now I, I let, let me say something. I, the the Pope, I think it was. I can't remember which pope it was. It might have been Benedict. It came to the United States several years ago. He went to, I believe it was Cincinnati or Pittsburgh, and they set a special mass for him at this big theater, a very ornate theater there in Cincinnati or Pittsburgh. I need, I got the pictures of it. I was so shocked. But it was a, a mass. It was t to Lucifer, Luciferus, and, and they said the pope was brought in, uh, and he was wearing his white uniform or whatever, and they set him down in the aisle. He was the, you know, like the central character. And then they did this this mass for him by some, you know, it was an incredible mass for him. And it was about Lucifer, and it praised Lucifer. And I, I, I looked at those those pictures, and I couldn't believe right here in the United States that, that the Pope came. I, I don't know the all the aspects of it. When I find that, again, I'm going to send it to you, uh, Ed. But okay. th this is this is what you're talking about here in, in yes. your book. And I, I, these are things that I've just recently discovered, and your book uh, sort of finalized it for me. Well, you know, we've only got a how, – how much time we got there, Jerry? Okay, we got five minutes because I did want to talk about what, what do we have in store for us in the United States. I, I mean, you say that they've targeted the United States. They've always targeted us. The, the Catholic Church – uh, are, are they going to have an impact here, or is it just so pagan that that they don't even need to be here? No, they they are working feverishly to undermine the United States. People should understand that the the Vatican and the Roman Catholic Church is not only a religious power; it is a political power. Uh, they have. Uh, their emissaries that they send throughout the, the world. And the, the ratio of the increase uh, of popery in any country is, correlates exactly to the decrease in the liberty in that country. Hmm. Okay? Um, and let me just give a, a 
a few quotes, and these are doctrines which are core doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church. Pope Pius X, for instance, stated that when one speaks of the Pope, it is not necessary to examine but to obey. No rights must be set up against the rights of the Holy Father. Uh, in fact, people can go right now and go on the Vatican website, and the Vatican, ex right on their website, describes itself as follows, and I'll quote right from their website, Vatican City State is governed by an absolute monarchy. The head of state is the Pope who holds full legislative, executive, and judicial powers. Now, that's all well and good, but people have to understand that under their religious and political view, they condemn freedom of conscience as an insane folly. And I'm quoting now from Pope Pius IX. He condemned freedom of conscience as an insane folly and freedom of the press as a uh, pestiferous error, which cannot be sufficiently detested. He stated in his syllabus erorum, uh, that no man is free to embrace and profess that religion which he believes to be true, guided by the light of reason. He is absolutely antithetic. That monarchy of the Pope in the Vatican is antithetic to the, uh, the Republican constitutional view of individual freedom with our constitutional right of conscience and, and religion and free speech. Uh, protected from government intrusion. Their view is that the government and religion should be joined and that their freedom of conscience is a folly and that the, the, the religion of the state should be Roman Catholicism. Now, how do they ever expect to put that into, into, into force, put that into reality in the United States? The illegal immigration and the naturalization, ultimate naturalization of those illegal aliens is one way to do that. The Roman Catholic Church is working feverishly to provide for and give aid and comfort to illegal aliens coming into the United States, particularly from Mexico. Why? 90% of the Mexicans that are coming into the United States um, are Roman Catholic. Actually, 91% are Roman Catholic. And so once they get uh, natural, naturalized citizens, once they become legalized and become citizens and have voting rights, the Roman Catholic Church's power in the United States will be uh, increased uh, exponentially because now, instead of simply being in the, uh, uh, um, uh, a, vo a vocal minority and having political power, they will have now hegemony. They will have control, not just some power, not just significant power, but all power. And once they get a majority of Catholics in the United States, then the persecution of Christians will then begin in earnest. Well, it seems like they've got the Supreme Court and uh, the government, and, and so the Catholic Church is on its way. Well, Ed Henry, I, I want to thank you for being on Power Prophecy today. And uh, I, want, I want you back again because this book is so tremendous. It's It's huge. And we've got a lot of ground to cover. So thank you very much, my friend. Thank you. All right. This has been Tex Mars. My special guest has been Edward Henry. He's author of many books. He's an attorney. Uh, and uh, this book is perhaps the best. Antichrist, The Beast Revealed by Edward Henry. Get it from us here at Power of Prophecy. So, friends, until next week, this is Tex Mars inviting you to tune in and listen to The Power of Prophecy.